The original Hidden Patterns Found in Roulette Results video was intended as a single standalone video demonstrating a specific type of hidden probability pattern. Our intention was to encourage viewers to analyze roulette results for themselves, introducing an understanding of how patterns form in data and over different bet sizes. To help with that, we produced a couple of videos on how to build your own probability tracker, which seems to have been well received, and to our surprise and delight it appears many people have completed the second version already. However, not everyone was quite so happy with the Hidden Patterns Found video. It appears we have effectively divided our viewers into two distinct categories, which from here on we will affectionately call probabilists and fallacists. Based on the diverse range of comments we've received so far, it's evident that our viewers encompass a broad spectrum of viewpoints on the subject, otherwise known as the gambler's fallacy. Perhaps there is also a third group of people who are just unsure or undecided about which camp they belong to, or haven't even thought about it yet, or don't understand why it's important, but that's okay. As this channel is about exploring under the hood of what really drives roulette results, we are going to widen the scope of this video to include a number of interesting topics for you to consider. These are in a specific order, as each topic draws on knowledge from the previous topic, so to get the most from this video, we suggest you sit back and watch each part in full. We have included a bonus tip at the end, with an idea so simple, if you haven't thought of it already, you might just kick yourself. Right, let's go. Here's a fun way to think about where you might be on your adventure into the realm of roulette, and will help us explain where this channel is heading. It's a bit of a generalization, and not meant to offend anyone. Most of us started by scattering chips willy-nilly hoping for a win, then started searching for that elusive betting system to make us rich. Some find a system or systems that suit them and learn to use progressive betting techniques, understand the importance of bankroll management, follow strict stop-loss rules and set profit targets, and those will definitely help. The majority, however, fail and blame bad luck, cheating casinos, or assume you cannot beat the house edge in a game of chance quoting the gambler's fallacy at anyone foolish enough to believe that you can. Sadly, there isn't any single clockwork betting system that can beat roulette in the long run. It's mathematically impossible. But that doesn't mean you can't beat roulette. It just means it's not as simple as we would like. To beat roulette, you need a dynamic system or systems. Tracking the many patterns in roulette results increases your ability to predict wins, or perhaps in some ways predicting losing streaks to avoid. Part one of this video was just a glimpse at one type of pattern found in all roulette results. To master roulette, there is a lot to learn and a long journey ahead. Are you ready to discover more? You probably realize by now, we never intended to present a complete system in the first video. If we had, then perhaps it would have had a much catchier title like Insane Genius 99.74% Invincible Game Changing Roulette Strategy Win Big Every Time. But you will never get a video like that from us. Our videos are focused on mathematically provable insights into roulette results or a how to build your own widget, moving us forward on the evolutionary scale of betting systems. A betting system, or more importantly, an effective strategy, has many elements to it. So for us to have provided you with a complete system, we would need an in-depth discussion first, covering a number of aspects and leaving you with a session or betting plan. As a bare minimum, a session plan should include things like the method, stake, profit goal, time or spin limit, the number of bets you might play at the same time, starting bet value, maximum progression level you will follow, which is similar to setting a stop loss, the progression itself, and of course you will need to identify a table that will accommodate your progression. Let's just fill out a basic example. How you set up a session plan is a broad topic and crucial to your success. The topic is so important it deserves a whole video to itself and we will produce one in the near future. Of course, likes, comments and subscriptions to this video will help to motivate us. We never start a session without a plan. Remember as they say, Failing to plan is like planning to fail. Let's move on. Many viewers requested a live demo of the trackers, some wanting to learn more, with others oddly wanting to see us lose. The version one trackers we created together are very simple, giving insight to just one aspect of data. However, they are dynamic, so arguably already a step ahead of a clockwork system. 
Version 2 of the 12s takes another step forward by offering insight and choice. So with what we have built so far, this is our favored option for a live demonstration. Right, live demo time. So let's get ourselves organized. First, we need a session plan. Oh look, here's one we prepared earlier, how convenient. Because our spreadsheets can monitor two groups at the same time, we might spot an opportunity to place two separate bets, so we have allowed enough stake to cover two progressions running concurrently. Needless to say, running two bets at the same time is harder to keep track of. You can stay on top of this by creating a couple of progression templates. Get some old pennies or something similar to use as placeholders, then tracking your bets is really easy to follow. This is perhaps even more important using this method when you are aiming for a two or a six, as you may have to park your bets for a few spins until the results allow you to continue. I'm sure we will see examples of this as we play. The first thing we need to do is enter some starting point data. For that, we will enter the most recent spin results. Then we just wait for the next result, which is 24. There is some interest in aiming for a five from the dozens and a five from the columns. Let's start with just one bet, and we will choose the five from the columns as the chart is heavy on the opposite side. With the 13 winning from column one, we cannot get a five as a result for the next spin, so we can park that bet for a minute. The five in the dozens is still the most behind and looking most likely. Let's start a second bet also aiming for a five. We have a two from the last result, so we need a three. So let's place our bet on the third dozen. Seventeen lands. We didn't win, but both of our bets are now in play, and both need a three, so we move one step on both progressions, placing bets on the third dozen and third column. We lose both bets. It isn't a great start to a demonstration. The eight lands and means we cannot achieve a five for the dozens, so we park that bet. The columns, however, can continue. Aiming for a five requires a three, so it's the third column again where we place the bet. Another loss, and both bets must now park. Don't worry, this is normal, and we are only a few progressions in. Twenty-five lands and the dozens are back in play with the bet shifting onto the second dozen this time. Thirty-three wins, and this could be the worst demo ever, but confidence increases as the outliers get stronger in our favour. Both bets are back in play, so the second dozen and second column receive chips for the next progression levels. We are only 14% into our stake, it's only down to 86 pounds. No need to sweat just yet. After eight spins, we get our first win, although we do not move into profit yet, as we still have the ongoing column bet. With 24 entered as the winning pocket, our column bet is in play, and looking at the dozens, it would appear the five is still a reasonable bet, so we will start a new dozen bet and move forward with the column progression. By spin nine, we crawl into a small profit. We have already started a new bet, aiming for a five on the dozens, and looking at the data starting a new column bet, also aiming for a five, is the decision we are going to make. Twenty-five wins for the dozens. However, the dozens chart is not really giving us a clear guide at this point, with both the three and five are fairly equal and the two and six not really adding much to the reasoning. Although there is variance in each individual bar, overall the chart is fairly balanced. Let's leave the dozens for a bit and wait for better outliers. The column bet parks again. Let's fast forward to spin 17.
You can see there wasn't much excitement. We parked on a few spins and moved forward a couple of steps on the column's progression, then spin 17 produces a win. The dozens chart is not much help. However, the columns chart is still suggesting that five is a reasonable bet due to the imbalance shown by the outlier of the three's data. So we will continue aiming for a five. Let's fast forward again to spin 26. So possibly the world's most boring system, but excitement is for gamblers. Low risk and steady is the hallmark of a professional player in almost all forms of gambling. We are on target to achieve our session plan, so let's continue. The data suggests five is still the most behind, so let's aim for another five. It's another win, and our data pattern is starting to change shape. Here we can see the four and five now have roughly the same gap. We have had a few fives win in a row, four should dominate, and three is still ahead, so you could reason that switching to aim for a four would be prudent. As for the dozens, well, the data is so close to expectation it's best to leave them well alone for now. We lose the next spin. However, as we are aiming for a four now, and it's the dominant data point, you never have to park this bet. It's always possible to get a four or dominant data point. So we hit our four within a few spins, and you may have realized our bets have been funded by profit alone for the last 20 spins. Let's switch back, aiming for a five, and fast forward to spin 36. One brings us a win, and just in time to say it was still funded with profits. As you can see, this method is nothing exciting, it's just a slow and steady growth system. Our stats have improved, and we are still on target, and of course you can increase your stake and bet size to improve your hourly rate. The data hasn't changed much with the dozens practically hugging their expectation pattern, so as boring as it may be, we continue aiming for a 5 with the columns and fast forward to spin 48.
Okay, hands up. Who thought we was going to have to use our own money for the next spin? Yes, we did too, but a cheeky six saved our blushes. Just look at the dozen's data for a second. Could it get any more even? It's a good job we are playing on version two of the 12s and have the choice of two different groups. Of course, the version one trackers we built together work the same as the version two that we are using now, but monitoring only one group at a time means you could be waiting for ages for some decent outliers. Right, we are close to our target. What bet would you place now? It's got to be between the four and five again from the columns. Let's stick with the five. Another win, that's nice. Right, nearly there. Four and five are neck and neck. The three is still strong. We've had a few fives win in a row and four should dominate. Hopefully by now you can guess where we're going to bet. That's right, we are going to switch a name for a four. Great decision. We hit the four straight away and reach our target. Let's clean up the screen and consider our results. We don't expect anyone to be excited by our £25 winnings. If you understand the point of the video, then it's the 25% or 40% per hour that should interest you. There is a plethora of ways you could set up a session plan to suit your own circumstances. But as we said earlier, that topic deserves a video of its own. Now let's be clear. The demonstration you have just seen only looked at one type of data pattern over two betting groups. We started testing this method over six years ago. It's just the first rung on the data analysis ladder, if you will. So please do not start betting fortunes on this system. Instead, allow us to illuminate systems that look at two types of data over four betting groups or three types of data over eight betting groups and beyond. Imagine harnessing the power of data analysis to make accurate predictions as the system becomes more sophisticated. We made a big claim in the video thumbnail stating, this will blow most people's minds. So perhaps we should look at the scale of the data roulette results produce. If you watched our gambler's fallacy fact or fiction video, you may recall us comparing coin flips with roulette spins, alluding to the outcomes as pieces of information. As you consider the results from more games, you can see the possible outcomes from a roulette wheel is exponential, so the number gets big really quick. At 10 spins, the number of outcomes is four quadrillion, 808 trillion, 584 billion, 372 million, 417,849. So, the chance of you seeing any of those last 10 results in that exact order is nearly one in five quadrillion. And why roulette results are considered as random. But consider these results. This time we are not concerned about what order they occur in. We are only concerned about the content of our 10 spins. Altering our perspective or asking specific questions allows us to calculate chance differently over a given number of spins, just by considering a bet on a specific set of pockets. Now that last question will be of interest to anyone playing even money bets. Look at that, a 1 in 1.00128 chance. That's practically a dead certainty. You can't lose, can you? Well, hold on, it sounds good, but there is an even higher chance of a loss. Anyone who has played the standard Martingale system on the even money bets for a while may have had success with many relatively small wins, but they probably have also suffered, or will do soon, a big loss by either depleting their stake or hitting a table limit. But how, when you are covering almost half the table over so many spins, can you lose? Playing a 10-level progression for this example means one of those losing 2 quadrillion, 469 trillion, 272 billion, 991 million, 125,593 sets of 10 results is an opportunity to lose and is always just around the corner. In a bid to combat this, we have seen systems out there covering 24 pockets and although it's counterintuitive with a 64.8% chance of winning, they lose more money faster. The progressions needed as bets get bigger, become more aggressive and produce smaller profits. Needless to say, at this point, we favor the smaller bets from the 12s downwards, with slower progressions that increase profits the more levels you play. We have gone a bit off topic here, having seen the small success we had by monitoring just two groups with six sets in play. The point of this section in the video was to talk about the number of groups or sets we could monitor in the future. We know the betting table offers us a selection of outside bets, with three groups of two sets for the 18s and two groups of three sets for the 12s. But have you ever thought, 
How many sets are there per bet size? What do you think? If we are going to monitor more groups or sets, we need to know how many there are. We can use combinatorics to help with this. And as a number of viewers seem to enjoy the mathematical side to our videos, let's have a bit of fun with a serious question. In combinatorics, we use the binomial coefficient formula to calculate how many ways there are to choose a set of pockets K from the sample space of all pockets N. This formula might look a bit intimidating, but it's quite straightforward when you put some familiar numbers into it. With this example, we will soon see how many unique 12 pocket bets we could make or monitor. We can simplify the formula a bit, then simplify it again. Ready for some more crazy numbers? The exclamation mark is the factorial symbol, which means we multiply the number by all its descending integers, down to 1. 37 factorial is an astronomical number. We are not even going to attempt to describe it. Let's just expand the other two factorials. Then we can work through all the numbers to get to the final answer. So who knew? Who knew there would be over 1.8 billion ways to make unique sets of 12 pockets from the 37 pockets available? That's a lot more than the six standard ones available from the dozens and columns on the betting layout. So, if you answered E, then you were heading in the right direction. You may be wondering why on earth are we wasting time on all of this? Well, if you're aiming to beat roulette, it's useful to know the size of your opponent. It seems fairly obvious now that our version 2 probability tracker isn't going to defeat or tame the dragon anytime soon. With over 137 billion possible bets, it's reasonable to say any computer-aided brute force attempt will prove futile. So, learning more about the predictive patterns in random data seems a lot more important now. So far, we have only explored a probability distribution from a group-level perspective by adding the set number of two consecutive results together and counting the values that get produced. But is there valuable information we could discover by looking at the sets individually? The most basic piece of information at the set level would of course be how many times a particular set has won. We can work out our expectation for a given size set of pockets. Then we could look at some spins to see if our results are in line with our expectation. We will use the spins from our earlier game where we input the first 13 spin results as a starting point. Then proceeded to play for 50 spins, giving us a total of 63 spin results. Now let's see how close they come to our expectations. So, this one simple count or measurement, if you like, tells us how close to expectation we are at a basic level for a given number of spins. However, just monitoring this on a spin-by-spin -spin basis doesn't offer much value in the sense of timely predictions. But let's think about sets winning from a different perspective. Sets must also have losses. By tracking those loss levels between wins, you will find another predictive pattern emerges. As you can see on the first entry, the 8-1. So the first dozen and second column are set to zero. All other sets increment by one. On the second entry, 28-1. So the third dozen and first column are set to zero and all other sets are incremented by one. Let's run forward a bit. Upon a win, we record the loss level from the previous spin. So in the case of the 14 winning, we can see the second dozen was at loss level 7 and column 2 was at loss level 1. As another example, look at the fourth line where the 8 wins. We would record a loss of 2 for the second column. The second column then has two repeat wins. And like we just said, upon a win we record the loss level. So we would record a loss of 0, then another loss of 0. So, by the tenth spin, we would have recorded and kept account of these pieces of data. Just looking at the raw data like this obfuscates any pattern, so we need to plot our recorded data onto a chart. By keeping count of the loss levels, a set of pockets encounters during a session, and plotting the data onto a chart for each set we are monitoring, you can see a geometric distribution pattern emerge. The blue expectation line, or expected pattern if you prefer, allows us to see in real time any outliers in the data. So, Let's consider these charts, which contain 63 spins worth of results. The 13 initial spins we entered before we started betting in the earlier demo, and the 50 spins we actually played. We now have two different perspectives on the same data, with the dozens and columns charts from our original tracker 
offering group level analysis via a probability distribution, while the individual dozen and column charts offer a geometric distribution view. The fallacists often state the wheel or ball have no memory. If you have seen 10 blacks in a row, you shouldn't expect to see 10 reds to balance things out, because roulette results are based on completely random independent spins. Such statements are usually hypothetical, in the sense that if you only had 10 spins worth of data in your charts containing just black numbers, then the statement holds some truth, as there isn't enough information available to argue otherwise. However, it should now be evident to probabilists and fallacists alike that patterns form from the continuous sequence of random roulette spins and can be used to predict future outcomes. With careful analysis of enough data, a good strategy or session plan, including correct bet size selection, a well-calculated progression and profit target to name a few items, you can predict future outcomes accurate enough to overcome the house edge. So how do we use this geometric data? Well, there's three main ways you can use this data, and while we have both data views on screen, let's discuss the most complex one, using the data as a check safe first. We only used a small amount of money in our earlier demo. As to a certain extent, we were lucky with the results. We had no assurance that the progression for any of the bets we placed wouldn't run beyond our stop loss. The session plan had been carefully designed for the profit goal in mind, but there wasn't any checking or protection against so-called extreme spin results. So, risking large amounts of money on such a basic system simply isn't prudent. However, with a second data view, we can check if our analysis of one type of data is supported by the other. If our confidence increases, then so can the bet value. A full explanation of how to cross-check data is outside the scope of this video. But for example, if we were continuing the game from the 63rd spin, we might have these thoughts in mind. 1. Both views from the dozens are too close to expectation to be useful, so our attention remains with the columns. 2. Column 2 is likely to cool off and produce some longer run losses. 3. Column 3 is likely to warm up and have some shorter run wins. 4. As the third column is likely to become dominant, aiming for the 4, 5 and 6 are still the best bets. 5. As the second column is likely to slow down reducing the number of 2s, then focusing on the 4 and 6 by running two separate column bets simultaneously would be a reasonable decision. Now bear in mind, we have been looking at the data by eye. In practice, we could quantify each chart against each other by calculating the mean, median, mode and range to get an accurate comparison, and considering more groups of charts at the same time would increase our knowledge further. In short, the more sophisticated a system we can build, the more accurate we can make our predictions. There are other ways you can use the geometric chart information. This is important for anyone who plays trigger bets, where you wait for a specific set to lose for a number of times, and then start a progression. Let's say you play the columns waiting for six losses in a row before you start betting. If you had been doing that here, and the second column got to loss level six, then without such insight, you might have happily placed a bet on the second column, and then wonder why it proceeded to lose beyond the scope of your progression. We can see there are some shorter runs missing from the third column, and possibly the first column, and this is why the second column can seemingly go cold. Many people underestimate just how far a particular set can go, and without enough information, you can easily make a bad choice and see your bankroll disappear. There is a way of playing geometric charts fairly safely on their own. For example, at this point in the game, we would be fairly confident that we would get a win on the third column at a loss level of one, at loss level of three, and a loss level of four. So you could easily run three bets simultaneously to take advantage of this. So instead of playing one progression continuously from a single trigger point on a set that is likely to run cold, Instead, with the information available, you could play three separate progressions, moving only one step forward on your progression each time you observe the trigger. This may take longer, but your stake is much safer. Right, final topic for this video. Let's talk about expected value. You can think of expected value as a way of comparing casino games or other forms of gambling, such as sports betting or playing a lottery. Let's ask Google's Bard and OpenAI's ChatGPT what expected value is. Bard seems to have a better understanding of the concept, and we agree with its points. The expected value is a long-term average and does not guarantee individual wins or losses in any particular game. The house edge is the built-in advantage that the casino has in each game. Of course, the terms house edge and expected value mean much the same. 
Games with a lower house edge are generally considered more favourable for players. Skill and strategy can significantly impact the expected value of some games, like blackjack and video poker. Although we would of course add roulette to the list of games where skill and strategy can significantly impact the expected value of the game. If expected value was that important, then surely everyone would just play blackjack. But of course that's not the case. Expected value has its uses, but its importance is often overstated. We hope anyone watching this video understands why you should avoid American Roulette and find a European wheel to play on. If not, then please watch the first episode of our series called The Complete Guide to Roulette, where we explain why you are less likely to win playing the American version of Roulette. The answer lies, of course, in its expected value, and although we are trying to explain why the expected value of a game isn't that important, there's no point making things harder on ourselves by literally giving money away. That said, you might now be wondering why we are not focusing on French roulette with its la partage and on prison rules. You can pause the video and read the rules if you wish, but we don't want to confuse things. It's rare to find a casino that supports such rules and they only apply to even money bets, therefore of no interest to our methods moving forward as we focus on smaller bets. So let's look at an example using 111 spins, which is three times 37. The example is based in a perfect world where each pocket will get its expected share of the action by winning exactly three times, and we assume a flat bet of one chip per pocket per spin. This is how the expected value of roulette is calculated, and one of the many fascinating facts about roulette is that every different bet size has exactly the same expected value. With a negative expected value game, the more pockets you cover, the more you are expected to lose. You might think because you win more often you are doing well, but it's just an illusion. If we bring back the progressions for the 12s and 18s, or Martingale if you prefer, with both examples on screen, you can see the bigger the bet, the more effort it will take to turn it positive and outrun the expected value. This difficulty is amplified by the low returns from the bigger bet progressions. Now we have to acknowledge the French are excellent mathematicians, both now and in the past. But what really blows our minds is that so much of what we have discussed in this video can be attributed to Blaise Pascal and Pierre de Fermat, who were both born over 400 years ago. Crazy, huh? But maybe that's why the age-old French roulette rules encourage the player to play the bigger bets by offering them what seems like a better deal for the player. Actually works better for the casino in the long run. Very clever. Let's get back to the example. Even playing the 12s progression, you can see it's not plain sailing, although at least your profit or contribution to outrunning the expected value increases the more loss levels you play. This is why we said earlier, we prefer smaller sized bets. You can always increase your coverage by playing multiple smaller bets concurrently. The smaller, the bet size, the higher the ROI, and greater the contribution to whatever session target you have set. In the earlier demonstration, we used analysis of a group-level probability distribution to decide where to bet. Then we discussed how using set-level geometric data could have increased our confidence in the analysis. Let's break it down and look what it actually means to beat the house edge or outrun the expected value. There are two ways to erode the house edge. In simple terms, if you are flat betting, then you need to increase the frequency of your wins beyond expectation. Or if you are using a progression, then you need to win before your progression goes beyond its scope. Of course, a combination of both at the same time would be optimal. In today's live demonstration, our method was to simply ensure our progression stayed within its scope by betting on the outliers, the bets that were already trailing behind expectation. A bet that is already trailing behind is less likely to have an extreme loss and derail your progression, and the opposite is also true. A bet that is ahead of expectation is more likely to have an extreme loss in order to fall back in line. You could say this is the essence of the whole gambler's fallacy argument here, but data doesn't lie. This isn't hypothetical. What we have shown today is a typical result. And coincidentally, in the 50 spins we played, we placed exactly 37 bets and won exactly 12 times. So in this case, it was the progression alone that beat the expected value of the game. So, we hope that gives you a better understanding of expected value. But as for the hidden patterns found in roulette data so far, you have only seen the tip of the iceberg. What? Really? Okay, bonus tip time. At this level, it's still possible for your progression to go deep while you watch your stake go down faster than the Titanic. 
If you get that sinking feeling, then there is a lifeline you can use to keep your head above water. This is just a brief overview of safer ways to play progressions. It's another topic requiring a video all of its own. So remember, this is just to demonstrate the concept. In reality, every session and situation is different. So how you use the following methods will depend on the bet size or progressions you are playing, the type of bet you have made, the amount of stake you have available, and your attitude to risk. Let's look at the first example. You are playing safe and are running a progression using a loss level of one on the third column as your trigger. Things do not go to plan. The third column has lots of wins, but not the one you are aiming for. Your progression is getting out of control. You can throw yourself a lifeline at any time by starting a second progression on the same bet. This is a better option than giving up or even worse following the bet beyond your stop loss. Let's assume you have a higher stop loss than us and you don't get a win for 12 levels. Playing only one progression would use 300 chips. By switching to a lifeline after say level seven, reaching 12 levels now will have only risked 42 chips and given you a small win. Although of course you still have 30 chips out on the first progression. What happens next we will come back to in a minute. Let's look at another example first. Bifurcation. Let's assume you just can't resist playing those negative trigger bets, but want to add some additional safety. You can simply bifurcate or split your bet into two or more separate progressions and alternate them over the course of your bet. This effectively doubles your progression's resilience. At some point you can assume one of your progressions will win and then of course you are left in a similar state as the lifeline example. The outcomes and scenarios for this topic are endless. We have ended the bifurcation example at the same point as the lifeline example, so it's easier to discuss what happens next. It's impossible to tell you exactly what solution is best going forward without a solid understanding of the data in the session you are playing. However, we would hope by now, you have a reasonable understanding of how the two basic types of data we have been looking at can help you make decisions. So there are a few options for you to consider, as with both methods, you will be left with a progression that hasn't yet won. We assume whatever bet you are playing is behind on its expectation. So depending on how strong your outliers are, you could dilute the current progression into two or more progressions. This works better with smaller bets, where it's easier to dilute to just two progressions. However, for the larger bets, you could just dilute to more progressions and alternate from there. Another option is to balance up, so you would keep playing or looping on the second progression. The chances are you will win a number of times on the second progression before you balance up, which is all adding towards your session target. If you reach your target before you balance up, then it doesn't matter anymore. If not, then when you balance up, you can alternate from that point with caution, depending on your confidence in the data, or you treat both progressions as separate bets and use the lifeline method. Most of the methods explained here work better with the smaller bets, where you have more levels in the progressions to work with, and you can set a number of split points. Of course, you need to think about these actions ahead of playing a game, what methods you're going to use, what loss levels you are going to split on, and the overall stake required all needs to be included in your session plan. Well, that's about it for today. So tell us, did we live up to our claim in the thumbnail and blow your mind? Are there any fallacists looking to convert to probabilism? How many different sets did you think there were? Please leave us some comments. We would love to know which part of the video interested you the most and what you would like to see more of. Now pay attention, class. You at the back, be quiet. If you want to get good grades, your homework for this evening is to like this video and subscribe to this channel. I'll see you all bright and early in the next video. Class dismissed. Oh, <laughs>